Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind to both employees and customers love and support. Thanks to Biz Simply for sponsoring this episode as our show partner. And Biz Simply is the all-in-one HR, workforce management, roads and operations software designed and built by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, to how we grow our businesses, to how we serve our customers. Together, we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long term, not just survive. People want that quality, they want that story, and, and they want to be part of your journey. And I think that's that's really important as well. So it's it's product over everything for, for, for street food vendors for me. Quality food, don't cut corners, believe in yourself, work with the right people. And, and if, you, if your food's good enough, if your product's good enough, then, then you should be successful. This is Simon Mitchell, CEO at Curb Food. Curb is the amazing membership organization that supports London's most innovative street food businesses through its incubator programs and its markets around London. In this episode, Simon and I sat down to have a conversation about the post-pandemic situation for street food traders. Simon shares it's been a very hard time for the sector, but he believes and can see early signs that great opportunities are ahead for street food. He also shares his most significant learnings from the last 18 months and how Curb has changed their approach to their business model, incorporating a social enterprise model at the heart of the organization, working with corporate partners to develop a new business model. We talk about Curb's learnings from the staffing crisis and what we can do to overcome it. Simon also shares his views on the future of hospitality and street food and have some stellar advice along the way. Before you tune in, please sign up to our weekly newsletter packed with more Maverick insights, strategies and tools. Find the links in the show notes and visit hospitalitymavericks.com. Now, grab coffee, notebook, there will be some great learnings in here on how to navigate uncertainty, but keep on doing the right thing. Today we'll be talking about a part of our industry yeah, we have all been hit hard, but this part of the industry, I know because I have some contacts there, has been hit really hard during the pandemic, and that's the street food traders. Uh, they were out without any opportunity for trade, many of them, or maybe didn't have that network or security that many others had, or these opportunities or any, any other had in this pandemic. Um, and the most progressive brands that we know started up here. The best MVPs has been actually started up in in street food and some of the best ideas comes out of street food when it comes to food across the world and one of them we we know really well is honest burger and we had tom on the show recently talking about their journey and how essential it was for them to start very small and get a lot of things right before they scale so to uh, get some really strong insights on this an overview of where the street fooders are today and where they're going after all the struggle in the pandemic we have uh, simon from curb on the show. So welcome to the show, Simon. I'm really looking forward to talk about, you know, the not so maybe so much about the past. We've all been through that, but actually more about how the future looks. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, Simon, you've been with Curb now for since 2016, isn't that correct? Where you joined uh, Curb in the, the early days. That's right, coming up to that. Six years, I think, in January. Yeah, and, uh, and, you, and you went through, through the pandemic with, you know, some of the parts that was most hit by the uh there's a lot that has happened you know people know curb from the the vibrant street food umbrella company that actually helps you know uh, small operators to go from zero to hero almost and you had different programs you are across the city with different markets but what what happened if you should give us like you know a, an overview of you know you know from the day you had to shut everything down to you back in business today. What's happened? There's a lot of change, I guess, on your side as well. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously two sides to the story. There's there's the trader side and their perspective and obviously us as an umbrella organization at Curb. And, and for the traders, they were really hit the hardest um, because, as you said, from March 2019, um, there were really very few opportunities at all. Uh, for them to trade. All of our lunch markets closed um, at the end of that March. 
And actually, we haven't been able to open a lunch market again until two weeks ago. So it really has been a complete break with no trading opportunities. Um, some of them found some weekend local opportunities. Then other than that, their business completely disappeared all night. No corporate events, no no city centre lunch markets um, and, and no support. And I think that's the biggest thing is the majority of our members slipped through the cracks of the government support. They couldn't furlough themselves because um, they tend to be self-employed, small businesses. So the support for self-employed was was very limited, as we know. Um, they didn't get any rent relief because they tend not to have premises by nature. Um, the business rates relief only only worked if you had a kind of a public facing premise. And for a lot of these guys, the only premise they had was their production kitchen or their prep kitchen, if they even had that. So um, very little of the direct support that went out to hospitality by, by means of um, furlough, um, rent relief grants, and also the, the local government grants that went to properties um, in hospitality completely bypassed street food. So um, for the majority, very little support at all. Some uh, maybe found a pivot in meal delivery kits, but I don't think for, for anyone really that replaced the lost revenue. And, you know, I think some have packed up and given up the industry. Um, some have taken, you know, roles in other industries. Uh, I could say that from Curve's perspective, we started the pandemic with close to 100 members. And when we reviewed our membership earlier this year, we were down to about 70 members. So that's quite a big chunk that, that aren't currently trading at all. So it really was very hard for those guys and, um, um, and very frustrating for us because we had no work either. Um, so um, really not a good time. And then for Curb as the umbrella organization, very similar story in that um, we, we didn't have any lunch markets. All that revenue was gone. Corporate catering is a, is a large part of our revenue. That disappeared completely overnight. And our food hall, Seven Dials Market, obviously had to close its doors. Um, for us, furlough was, was a godsend. We managed to keep our team in its entirety um, and have somehow navigated in and out of the various restrictions over the last year. We've been open and closed and open and closed and open again and we're open currently you know seven days a week full hours uh fully let but it's it's a struggle even now it's it's nowhere near back to to where we were beforehand yeah and i guess also because you are very dependent on london traffic so commuters tourists that hasn't really returned to the city and and, and the movement of people in general are still cautious i guess in london you know, all of our lunch markets are in city, London city centre locations, you know, the Gherkin, West India King, Canary Wharf. And we were only able to open those lunch markets um, early this September when when schools closed and people did start to venture back to the offices, but they're still nowhere near um, what they were like pre-pandemic. But there is enough trade there to open. Likewise, Seven Dolls Market in Covent Garden, um, no office workers and no tourists at all to speak of. Um, has kind of, you know, destroyed our our, our market there. And um, we were okay through the summer. We had quite a lot of families um, and Londoners kind of coming in for the day. Then towards the end of the summer, we had some, you know, staycationers coming from other parts of the country. But again, now the schools have gone back. It's a bit of a struggle with the lack of office workers and the complete lack of tourists. Have uh, all this changed the, the purpose of uh, Curb? What you initially set out to as an organization, have, have that changed with the pandemic or is it still the same purpose and vision and mission you have for? No, we've actually um, undergone some major changes as a result of the pandemic. Um, one of the real benefits of the pandemic, if you want to find one, was that it enabled us to stop and have a look at our business um, with some time and really think and examine um, what we're about. And we, as a senior management team, we would meet regularly on Zoom um, and discuss how we wanted to emerge from the pandemic. And we always had a conflict within Curb of um, of being almost, you know, a social enterprise and wanting to develop businesses and incubate businesses and weren't always about the profit. But then we had other parts of our business, like our corporate catering and our food hall, that are very corporate by nature and come with high pressure. Um, and that tension was something we'd always struggled with. Um, at the same time, we were approached by Levy UK, which is part of the Compass Group, um, to take a stake in our event catering business with the idea of um, 
putting street food traders into sporting stadia, initially in London, but ultimately around the rest of the country. And we actually decided to enter into that deal as a joint venture. Um, so we've now split our business in three. We have a, a corporate catering business called Curb Events, focusing on corporate event catering, but also retail at sports centers. Um, and then we have our food hall business, which owns Seven Dials Market. Um, and then what we've done with Curb Food, which was our initial, initial business, is that business is now going to double down on the on the real purpose of Curb, which is incubating and accelerating talent, of finding people um, with an idea and helping them develop that idea into a successful hospitality business. Um, and we actually are going to make that business into a social enterprise. So as of January next year, Curb Food will become a social enterprise and all the funds received into that business will be reinvested in getting young people who might not otherwise have the opportunity, employment in hospitality. And, and um, even more important to us is, is trying to empower people to own their own business. So can we find some young people that have a great idea, but maybe not the means to start a street food business and help them on that journey? Because obviously that, that's, that's the real goal here is, is helping people achieve um, complete financial freedom and being in charge of their own destiny. So we're very excited about being able to um, develop that part of our business. We're currently recruiting for a managing director of that business. Um, and I think that that will be a really nice balance to have these two quite corporate entities. Um, but the heart of Curb, we call it the heartbeat, uh, the part of Curb that deals with our traders, with our membership that finds new talent and develops them and also runs our education platforms, that's all going to become a social enterprise. So we're incredibly excited about that. And that will launch in January next year. And I think that's super interesting because as you look at them, some of the most successful businesses in the world, like take Patagonia, for example, they also have a social enterprise thing around the planet and politics. And they've also shown that you actually can drive corporate profitability and social enterprise hand in hand because they they feed the other. There's the heartbeat, as you say. So it's super interesting that you're bringing that to the uh, hospitality scene. Uh, I can't come up with any any other hospitality business that's doing that currently. So I think that's super interesting. Going to be super interesting to to follow that, and uh, also a great way to to start get talent back into the the industry. I guess because not everybody joins the industry to become a career they want to learn how to run a business and that's what i meet as well and a lot of young people they want to own their own business if i can have my own business so it's so a part of our role as leaders is to create entrepreneurs for the future we need them more than ever absolutely i'm, I'm incredibly passionate about it i think hospitality's had a bad rap for for a lot of years and actually the way the government's treated hospitality in the uk through this pandemic's kind of <laughs> reinforced that message i think as well but you know, it, you can carve out an incredible career um, in hospitality. It's an amazing industry to work in. It's a lot of fun, um, but you can be successful. And, you know, I've, I've been very lucky and I've been, you know, moderately successful in hospitality. And I and, and my, my co-directors at Curb, we're very passionate about offering other people that opportunity. Um, other people that might not have thought about hospitality as a career, um, and maybe don't have the means to, to to get into hospitality as a, as an entrepreneur as well. So we we feel we have a really interesting way of of developing that. And and there are other people in in hospitality doing that kind of thing. But I think we also have, the benefit of Curb is we also have the outlet, so we could bring people in. But we you know we employ people directly. But all of our members again employ people at every kind of level level. So the access we have across the, the whole spectrum of the industry, whether it's our, our brewery, Gypsy Hill, we partner with, or one of the vendors um, at Seven Dials Market or on our lunch markets, or working for us on the floor in our food hall. There's a lot of um, spaces there where we can get people in and train them and develop their careers um, and hopefully create some future leaders. Yeah, and I guess you, you, you touch on something here again. We need to do new things to actually bring the... Uh, the profile around hospitality or the perception around hospitality back again in a way and actually make it attractive for young people to, to actually to join the industry because that's the reality of where we are we're not going to fix it overnight and we're probably going to be in a in a staffing crisis for years and and we we can come back to that in a second uh, we talked a bit about the pandemic in in the beginning uh, what have been you know your you know what did you learn from the pandemic what has been your life and leadership lessons going through the pandemic because we all 
taken something with us and we left something behind probably as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's a few things, you know, initially it was panic and w what the hell are we going to do? But actually, I think one of the key learnings was to, to not panic and to take the time to really think and think outside the box. And, and you know, I think you've seen a lot of that in the, in, the, in the pandemic, whether it was, you know, the meal kits that suddenly popped up everywhere and everyone was pivoting into um, that, you know, our current ways of earning a living and just not there. We have to think differently now. Um, and we have to, you know, look at different opportunities and different ways of running our business. And I think that was the thing for me was um, being brave enough to take a bit of time to really look at the big picture and, okay, what are we going to do to get through this pandemic, which, you know, at the time I thought would be six months, a year. Here we are still in the middle of it, if you ask me. Um, how are we going to structure our business so we don't have to go through this again? Um, and if we do go through this again, that we're, we're maybe a bit more diverse, diversified um, and protected in the future um, and, and took some brave decisions. I think, you know, on one hand, we've, you know, done a big corporate deal with Compass. On the other hand, we're looking at um, our purpose and it being more about just being a corporate entity and the money and you've got to make money. Actually, um, I think what's kept a lot of the team at Curb going is the, th the thought that on the other side of this, we're going to have an opportunity to do something really important. You know, people have been lucky, I suppose, um, in, in terms of the furlough scheme and keeping their jobs and employment through this process. Um, so what's going to motivate you on the other side? Because lots of people haven't actually worried about job security through this. It's, it's been okay. But, but what, when, when it comes back, why, why do I care? What's going to get me up in the morning? Why should I go to work? And I think that's one of the things that's always been important to me, but I think that we've really been able to spend some time focusing on you know, by not being busy is what is the thing that's going to get our team up and motivated in the morning to come to work and our traders to want to trade with Curb and our, our customers to want to come to our, our markets. It's it's about being more than the pound and pence and um, and having a, a, a vision that is, to, to, you know, to, to impact people's lives and create a bit of change as well. And uh, is there any specific things you have uh, done? You, you did the foundation bit where you're, you're restructuring the company. That's a massive move, you know, and, and you're probably going through that now and not done before sometime next year. Is there other things you've done like practical practices you changed around that to make sure that the purpose is in the forefront as you come back yeah i mean we've really looked at our membership you know we're, we're one of the big observations for curb was that 10 years ago when we started it was all about street food and all of the brands you know emerged on the streets like honest burger you referenced um pizza pilgrims bow some brilliant brands in london that emerged on the street and with curb but actually the, the world's changed and it's not just about the streets anymore you know there's lots of opportunities for other kind of pop-ups be it in pubs or empty units on the high street the change of the planning um, regulations um, have influenced that and, and just the space on the high street is creating more opportunities so we're trying to uh, pivot away from being just about street food and actually being more about just independent food and business and drink so you don't have to have a street food van or gazebo to work with Curb anymore. If you're doing something brilliant in a pub or you've managed to find your first small own premises, then, then we want to help you and we want to give you an, an opportunity to reach, reach a wider audience and help develop your business. So that was a big fundamental change for us. And also, you know, behind the scenes, we've worked with brilliant independent drinks brands for years, uh, but we've never really shouted about it. So we, we partner with Gypsy Hill for an incredible brewery. Um, uh, you know, very independent, um, employee owned now as well. Um, so, so they make the majority of our beer. We've worked with East London liquor for years for our, for our gins and our vodkas, um, and square root soda that started in Hackney as well. We've, we've supported them from day one, helped them raise finance, help support their business. So being just a bit more than street food and actually diversifying into independent food and drink was a big one for us. That's super, super interesting, Simon. You also talked about that uh, we need to think differently. Uh, do you think that the industry is on that journey? Have we re have we changed our game and the playbook? Are we changing it as we're coming back? Yeah, I think there's 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 a lot of really encouraging things on the horizon. I think um, customers are are becoming a bit more educated about where they go and where they eat, and I think 
certainly, you know, I've seen a, a lot more interest in independence and seeking out genuine quality and independence rather than the big chains that were taking over, you know. Five, ten years ago, it was all about finding a business and suddenly having a hundred of them on every single high street. I don't think the public are interested in that anymore. I think they see through it. I think people want a bit more of a story from their time out. You know, getting people out into city centres like London at the moment is a challenge. I think when people do make that journey, whether on the tube or, or paying the congestion charge and whatever and coming in by car, they want an experience. And I think there's a real shift towards um, creating experiences and, and educating customers on the story behind your business. I think sustainability is going to be a huge one for the future. Um, it's been something that I think a lot of people have paid lip service to for years, but actually as an industry, we can have a huge impact um, by cutting our meat consumption, by looking at our waste, by just looking at the way we do things in, in, in you know practice in our in our restaurants and bars and, and, and food halls. I think that's going to be a huge um, driver of change in the future. You know, the, the world we're in right now, whether it's Brexit or the pandemic, um, empty shelves in the supermarkets isn't something people are used to. You know, there's this kind of, you know, I can get whatever item it is of food or drink in an instant, whether it's from Amazon through the door or at Tesco or, you know, going to a restaurant and getting crazy, you know, um, dishes that are flown in from the other side of the world i think and i kind of hope as well that some of that's ov over and we start to appreciate what we've got here a bit more and and start to think about how if we're going to eat meat how our meat is farmed and is it done this, this sustainable way um cutting down our meat consumption thinking about what's in season and you know i think it's been something that's been a bit trendy and a bit of a buzzword and people have paid lip service to for years but i think it's now a necessity People are going to have to think about where their food comes from. And that's that's got to happen. And that's going to be a big change that has started and maybe been accelerated by the pandemic and Brexit. But I think is is only going to be positive for the industry. Yeah. And I guess as as you are venturing out on the journey and catching up with that, that will only benefit business. And I guess independent operators really are they already have that care for these things. That's that's why they went into business. They had some kind of obsession about a product or the way they deliver that product. And actually, they're obsessive about where that tomato comes from. And they will send those tomatoes back if they say, we'll not take anything from outside the UK. They will send them back. That typical, the independent operator. And they can really leverage that storytelling in this new environment to the consumers. There's practical advantages as well. You know, the last bank holiday, there were these scare stories in the press about pubs running out of beer. Well, you know, we never had any of those problems for a second because all, all of our booze is made in London. Mm. So if, if even if our suppliers did have a problem with HGV drivers, we could have gone and picked it up ourselves in our transit van. So there's practical uh, reasons to do this as well and not to, you know, ship in your beer from Europe and your produce from South America. Um, there's great stuff here and we can we can live off it and eat and drink off it and still have great quality um, and, and support, you know, our local ecosystem. Yeah, and I think that that's the interesting part of that conversation is about, well, getting the supply chains back up to uh, the level we want to exactly, you know, shifting into a local ecosystem. Actually accept that even if you have a group of restaurants, a chain of restaurants, you might not have the same beer everywhere. And, uh, and you shouldn't because it should fit that no, local community. Right. Um, and it's just going back to how hospitality was you know, when I was growing up and in my mom and dad's pops, you know, they, they had maybe one national beer, which was the Carlsberg, funny enough, or Tuborg. And then they had like local, independent local brewers at that point as well. Um, what is your, you talked a bit about, you know, we talked a bit about the staffing crisis. I guess you've all, all also seen that in the, as you're coming back with the, the traders and, you know, needs to hire people. Maybe you had had to hire people yourself. Um, what have you learned from? Because we're still learning from this staffing crisis. And my guess is not over yet. I don't know what the horizon is, but it seems like quite far out right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what I've learned from it, but I can tell you it's the one thing that keeps me up at night at the moment is um, the chronic shortage of uh, staff our industry is facing. And, you know, it's across the board. So in our in our food hall, we're struggling from everything from kitchen porters to barmen to management. You know, we really just can't get enough. Um, we can't get any really skilled staff in 
you know, and we're having to get people that aren't skilled and train them, which is great. And, you know, in, in normal times, we're all about that. But when they're all at that level and you suddenly have to train everyone, there's an impact. Um, I think for our traders, what we're seeing is that they've got the same thing. They can't attract staff. There aren't that as many, um, you know, casual labor people out there at the moment. And we've got traders that typically may have done three different things on a day for us. They may have traded at a market and done an event for us and maybe been at a fixed site of ours as well. Now saying, look, guys, we can only do one thing because we're just doing it ourselves. You know, so we our capacity has been reduced of what we can sell because the traders can't do it. And, and their ability to bounce back and grow is limited because they can't get the staff to help them do that. It's it's a real worry. We're launching a big um, project imminently, um, having to recruit dozens of people. And, you know, we, we are struggling across the board. And I don't know the answer. Unfortunately, I don't have any great insights. I am worried about it. And I don't know where the answer comes. You know, it's, it's a re-education of the population that this is an industry that you can and should work in. Where I think for a long time, we've uh, stuck our noses up at hospitality and thought that other people do those jobs. I think um, getting young people in and training them has to start now um, and treating people better and paying people better. Um, I, you know, we pay quite well and are still struggling. Um, so I, I don't have the answers and I, it does keep me awake at night because I don't see the end. You know, there's a just a chronic shortage of people that are available and want to work in hospitality and it is affecting you know every part of our business yeah and i guess as um support starts to disappear from furlough schemes to vat whatever it is that's been in, in place not having the people to reach your sales or your capacity or the supply chain not working for you can really be the last straw i guess for for many operators as well out there Absolutely. Seven Dials Market, as an example, you know, we've started to pay business rates now. We've got 24,000 square foot in central London. That's not insignificant. And as we start to pay more and we start to pay rent, um, you know, and the people aren't there, you know, to, to spend money, all these additional costs pile up. You know, we're having to use agency staff because we don't have our own and that that comes at a premium. So we're being squeezed from absolutely every angle, whether it's business rates, rent, Food costs, you know, of course, going up, staff costs going up, lack of staff. It is a struggle. And, um, you know, for me, the support has never gone far enough for our industry. I was in Berlin two weeks ago and hospitality businesses there were really well looked after um, based on their, you know, their turnover and EBITDA rather than their business rates, which, you know, our business rate system is a farce anyway. Um, and I think the support has been lacking for hospitality through the whole pandemic. You know, we've survived, but we've taken on debt. We've made sacrifices and it's all ending now. And, and what have you got? You've got the prime minister telling people that potentially there's going to be um, maybe not further lockdowns. But, you know, telling people to work from home again has a fundamental impact on city centre businesses. So is there going to be more support? You know, and furlough is wonderful. You know, I, I can't speak highly enough about that scheme because it saved a lot of jobs but it saves jobs it doesn't help the businesses you know great if if we struggle again in november because people work from home we can keep our team if we don't need them but who's going to pay the rent who's going to pay the business rates who's going to pay the service charge who's going to pay the electricity you know or the cleaning costs Who, who's going to cover those costs once again when we're either forced to shut or have no trade um and i you know i'm, I'm fearful i think the rent moratoriums protected a lot of businesses. It'll be interesting to see what happens when that's over. Same for furlough. Um, you know, I think we've been lucky and we're very well supported as a business, but I know how hard it's been and, and there's going to be many, many more casualties. And, and, and uh, you know, I don't think this is over. We're going into the winter. You know, we, we seem as a country to be incredibly nervous, rightly or wrongly, um, of the pandemic. And, you know, people will be slower to come back to city centres, at, at, if at all, and it's going to be dragged out. And I think we've all got to face up to the fact that we're going to be, you know, under restriction in some way, shape or form until next summer, at least. And it's super interesting. It's it's really come under radar the last couple of weeks as we came out of the summer and the school the kids went back to school. And, and it feels like, you know, there's something 
leaking out of government, I would say, in the nicest possible way that they're gonna do they're gonna do something similar to what you say. Because that's what happens all the other times. There's been some leakers and some small statements and then suddenly, surprise, next week we are we're doing this. Um but what did that, you know, if you think about street food, we just said they fell between the cracks last time. And I guess it's not going to be any different if that happened this time. But we don't know that. We're just guessing that. But well, how does the future street food look? Because there must be so much talent that has left that as well, because there was just, just a viable future. I couldn't pay my bills. I couldn't I maybe have kids I need to feed and dress. And it was just not a viable thing. And lots of talent were lost that way. I guess you saw that as well. But what about the future? Is there is there a strong future for, for street food? Or is that is that the past? No, I think when, when we get back to normal, whatever normal looks like, I think there's, there's an incredible future. I think street food remains an incredibly accessible way of starting a food business. You know, everyone's heard the stats about starting a restaurant and how many fail and how much it costs. And that's changed, but but largely that still rings true. You can set up a street food business for, for relatively little capital, and it's fairly easy to get your first pitch at a local council market. Um, after the banking crisis, when Curb was kind of born, we saw a huge influx of new businesses from people that were escaping the city. You know, and that was interesting. We actually got some really interesting concepts and some brilliant food. I think what will happen this time is we'll get people that are escaping the hospitality industry that may be chefs that have been made redundant or lost their jobs, you know, restaurateurs that have lost their business and want to pivot to start again, have a new idea, let's start it on the street. So I actually think for us as a business and us as an industry, there, there, there will be a huge influx of new talent if and when we get back to normal. Um, and, I, you know, in the short term, it's a problem. You know, we don't have our lunch markets to incubate talent like we used to. That's where we do it. And we're not currently running enough markets to be able to run our incubator scheme. So we need to get back to some kind of trade and, and normality to be able to offer these schemes. But I do think in the flip side, there will be um, a lot of new businesses, a lot of interesting new businesses. Um, we saw that after the banking crisis. We'll see it again. We've just got to get to that point And you know, street food still remains, you know, a great route to, to starting your hospitality journey. And I think lots of people are aware now of some of the huge success stories that have started on the street. And want a piece of that action, let me try my concept in a cost effective way and see if people like it and if it sells, rather than taking the plunge immediately into the restaurant. Food halls as well, you know, food halls like ours, like all the other food halls that have popped up in the last few years, are another way of, of getting into hospitality and maybe not quite taking the risk on bricks and mortar, but 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 also not having to be on the street. So I think there are different ways that people will access this industry, not just on the street, but but street food will certainly be part of that conversation. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's interesting. You'll probably see, we probably haven't seen in the wider economy even yet what happens with people's job because we, we really don't know. I think we, as you said, everybody has job security, but... How, what the future looks like, nobody knows. Even outside hospitality, there will be people that are maybe going to lose their job and have to pivot in and start their own businesses. And uh, and you have already seen in the pandemic some quite interesting people get involved in hospitality that was maybe not from hospitality originally as well. And you say, I, I agree with you. I've seen a, locally here in Brighton, where I'm, I've seen a couple of chefs leaving their jobs and actually setting up their own small things and quite quickly establishing a, a, a minimal viable product they're testing. Uh, for, for very few money and it's actually accepted again you can just start with a hole in the wall as long as you have the passion and the quality behind then uh, then you can you can do more, some amazing things there yeah exactly what about um, your own journey what uh, Simon you said you've been very lucky you've got a great opportunity and I'm more thinking about why in principle why we should join hospitality there there's probably some people that's influenced you on this journey to take you from you know you started in hospitality to become a DMD now for for Curb and CEO. Yeah, I, I you know I I sort of fell into hospitality and I've I've probably told this story too many times. But um, as a as a teenager, I was a amateur DJ, um, not very good. Um, but um, met a couple of guys that were running um, some nightclubs in London and started DJing for them, and just had an idea when I graduated to 
um, try and broker corporate clients um, into nightclubs at a time where nightclubs didn't have event managers and didn't know what they were doing. Um, and it, it kind of worked and, and went well for quite a while up until the banking crisis. And um, and then, you know, nightclubs got wise and they started hiring event managers. So my, my career kind of pivoted into more traditional corporate events and catering. Um, but, you know, that early beginning, that that backing of me as a young man, um, there's a guy called uh, Bert Habib. He runs a business now called Uptown Events. Uh, he was my first boss at 16 and he kind of mentored me on that journey from not very good DJ uh, to entrepreneur and backed me in, in my first business to start doing that deal with the nightclubs. Um, I still speak to him now. He's a friend um, and has been there for, for all of my journey through good and bad. And he kind of, he taught me the value of, of you know, hard work and persistence, but also that anything's there as a possibility if you're willing to go and grab it. I think for my first six months working with him, he sat me in an office with a phone and a computer and made me cold call for eight hours a day, every day. And that kind of gives you a good grounding of, of how to hustle um, and how to sell. Um, so he, he's been a huge influence um, on my life in a positive way, in a kind of, uh, you know, entrepreneurial um, way. Um, I think also my next kind of, job so to speak um i won't name names but sort of was a huge influence on me on or from the other side so i went to an organization um after that um big corporate event organization and they brought in a new ceo who was terrible and i worked there for five years under this ceo and i learned exactly how not to run a business and and this business had 120 staff and when i went in it was a brilliant business and, and this person ripped the heart and soul out of it. Um, I ended up leaving and that's where my curb journey began. You know, and I, I felt like I, you know, I wanted to be the leader. I always had that passion. Um, but I think you've got to see how not to do it is sometimes as important as, as learning how to do it. And um, being able to learn from someone else's mistakes uh, was invaluable. And I, I take that with me every day to work, um, you know, fundamental things about looking after your team, valuing people creating a nice environment for people to work reminding them that there is more to work than just work that it's it's about more than a nine to five and a paycheck um creating a culture where people want to be um those are all big lessons i learned by watching someone do exactly the opposite in this uh year year we have been through is the uh, how have you actually managed to uh, you know show i call it show up pro high energy, you can call it, be in the impact zone. People have different words. How do you do that every day? Because it's been like out and digging mud every day. And every time you think you empty the hole, it was full again. Um, how, how do you keep yourself as a CEO in, in that balance So and, and, and manage all this uncertainty? So I'm an incredibly positive person by nature. I, you know, uh, not kind of blind faith, but I believe that, you know, you can with hard work and perseverance you can get yourself through a lot of things and i was determined to not be beaten by this and um and also kind of in a in a weird kind of way excited by the challenge that you know this is unprecedented there is no roadmap there is no way to navigate yourself through this and and you know having to do that having to survive because you employ a lot of people you know, and, and in our organization, there's a lot of other businesses that rely on us for their trade as well. So failure wasn't an option. Um, so having, you know, that determination to get through it was it was never in doubt. But we, I'm surrounded by great people. You know, my my team at Curb are phenomenal, phenomenal particularly the senior team who are around and, and throughout furlough and throughout the start of the pandemic. We spoke every week um, and we discussed how to get through this together. Uh, Petra, my business partner and the founder of Curb, um, she was living in New Orleans and she came back to support me and the business and just be there as someone to talk to through this. I wasn't completely on my own. Um, and I also had a very young child. <laughs> my <laughs> my youngest was born just before the start of the pandemic. So when I left my home office, I had a brilliant distraction um, to, to take my mind off the work stuff. And, and actually, you know, that was a great 
that that first kind of six months of lockdown one of the positives for me if you're going to take a positive was i've got a young family two young children and being able to be at home with them every day through that time when we had that great weather you know lucky i've got garden um to spend that quality time with my family was was a real positive you know and you had to look at it like that and take the positive so um yeah that that will to succeed and get through and survive coupled with a, a quite immense distraction um you know got me through it and i i'm i do love what i do i always have done I, the, the reason i left my last employer was that i wasn't enjoying it every day and i tell my team this regularly that the day that you don't get up and go to work and, and want to do it is the day maybe not one day everyone has a bad day but when you have a run of those <laughs> days that's the time to leave and find something that that drives you to get up in the morning and you know i was i i was in a place kind of six years ago where i i really hated my job and didn't want to go in anymore and um took quite a brave step to just leave without knowing what was next with one young child at that time uh, a mortgage you know all those responsibilities that everyone has but i just knew that i couldn't do it anymore and on the back of that you know i found curb and curb found me and it's been incredible so i've kind of practice what i preach and i'll continue to preach it even with people that i love in our organization if you don't want to be there i would encourage you not to be there anymore because you, you it's what you do all day long and then something like this happens and you've got to have the energy to be able to to to, to do that when there's no money coming in there is no reward you do it because you love it and you're passionate and you want it to survive um rather than just for the paycheck this comes back to the purpose you talked about as well again why why are, why are we getting up every day as an organization why are you getting up can you connect yourself with that that purpose of the organization i i couldn't agree more that today you don't have that then uh, you need to find something else because very quickly it will crumble uh, i think we all have had those situations through through life and i think as you said that there's a lot of reflection going on and we are not done yet as you say probably with the pandemic it probably will throw us a couple of uh, hurricanes more before we we out on the on the other side uh, as we uh, go forward uh, this is always my last questions to people on the the show and it'll be interesting maybe to hear from you what your top three advice would be to you know leaders in general in hospitality but also maybe to the people that's running their street food businesses because you have insights in both camps so what uh, what advice would you give to street food traders, both in operation and maybe thinking about launching? I think for street food traders specifically, it's, um, you know, believing in your product. And, you know, ultimately it all comes down to that. So having a great product um, with with brilliant ingredients that are well sourced, you know, if you if you have that and you can get in front of enough people, I think you're going to be successful. People seek out quality. You know, we used to run, when we ran uh, West India Quay, our Canary Wharf market, five days a week. Wednesday was the incubator day with the new traders. And it began to become more successful than the Thursday that was typically a busy day because people wanted to seek out what was new. So I think if you're a new street food trader, you know, first and foremost, don't come into it thinking, well, if I can get a really good street food business, I can get a restaurant. Think you need to have a passion for your product. You need to believe in your product. It needs to have a story. And if you have those things, if you really have a great product, whatever it may be, it could be something that's been done a hundred times, like a burger. But you know, if someone comes out with a new burger that has a point of difference, but there's real passion and love and providence in that burger, you know, and, and there's a story behind it, you know, you're going to be successful because people want that quality, they want that story, and and they want to be part of your journey. And I think that's that's really important as well. So it's it's product over everything for for, for street food vendors for me quality food don't cut corners believe in yourself work with the right people and, and if, you, if your food's good enough if your product's good enough then then you should be successful so i think um big learnings for me number one people's everything surround yourself with good people um take your time hiring um have have you know the people around you that you want to grow with um because no one can do it on their own you know we've um we've grown quite quickly over the past few years but we've we've and we've hired some senior positions that didn't exist before into our business head of people uh finance director and we've taken those hires really seriously and we've got some great people on board who really help drive this thing um who believe in our values and our mission and are aligned behind that um so definitely people 
um, don't always look at the CV, look at the person. Is this someone you can work with every day that can come on the journey with you and, and, and get along with you and believe in the same things as you? And the second one, big, for, big one for me is partnership. So a big part of our business is partnerships, whether it's landlords or investors or whatever. And um, we learned this lesson a few years ago with a large market we ran in North London. Um, if you don't have the right partner, don't do it. You know, you've got to want to do business with these people and they've got to, again, believe in your values and you've got to trust them. And and we got burnt quite badly with that a few years ago. And that's been for, forefront of my mind ever since. Whenever we go into anything new, it's, you know, these are the right partners to do business with. And whether it's Shaftesbury, who are our landlord at Seven Dials, I think they're a great landlord. They were incredibly supportive when we were trying to build the food hall. And what transpires is they are great partners and they've been incredibly supportive throughout this pandemic where lots of other landlords haven't been. Whether it's the investors in our food hall business, you know, we had a lot of interest in investing in us. We didn't go down the traditional kind of PE routes or or that kind of um, route. We went with a family office, um, private individuals that backed us, nice people that got, got us, our company, bought into our vision, got that we were a bit different. And again, What's, what, what have we seen through the pandemic? They've been brilliant supporters of us. They've been brilliant partners. They've been a great help um, and helped us navigate through this. Even, you know, even Compass, um, John Davies at Levy, who is our partner in our event catering business. He is, you know, you wouldn't think it from a big company like Compass, but he is a brilliant partner and he challenges us daily to be better. He's better than us on things like sustainability. He pushes us to be better um and we, we learn a lot from him so having great partners around your business and great people is absolutely everything if they're not right you'll know they're not right instinctively and whatever the deal might be don't do it if you don't see yourself being in partnership with these people long term don't do it and then think about you know what happens if it goes wrong you know how are you going to be able to to negotiate with or or, or deal with with someone when things go wrong. It, every, it's all very easy and lovely and rosy on the way up um, when there's lots of money and you're growing and it's exciting. But what happens when you hit a bump in the road? You know, is this someone that you're going to be able to work with and is going to support you, or is it someone that's going to kind of either run a mile or, or you know get kind of tough with you? So that they're my biggest learnings and and my biggest bits of advice is, is you know really think about who you surround yourself with. Yeah, so what you're saying is first who, then what, in principle. And I love that because uh, it's so key that actually, you know, we you can't, uh, the best people I've gone through with things was also people who have done my, you know, pre-work. I really knew them well, and we were on the same journey with the purpose. And, uh, of course, we all want to make money, but we knew that we had to look after each other to be able to do that. And I think that's, that's the key message here as well to the to the industry as we as we move further into the uh, to the next wave or whatever we call it now the the final phase of the pandemic the almost final phase i don't know but i want to send you uh simon uh power and energy into the team as well at curb and thank you so much for coming on the show and share the views from a street food trader's point of view on what's going on there and what happened with curb and all the wonderful things that's uh, in the pipeline thank you michael it's been great really enjoyed talking to you Thank you so much, Simon, for coming on the show, sharing your wisdom and optimism for the future of street food. I would recommend you now to sit down with a pen and paper and ask yourself, do my business model support the vision we are pursuing or does it make a positive impact on people, communities and the planet? To get further inspiration on how to think out of the box when it comes to your business model, please tune in to episode 94 with Elvin Turner, who is the order of Be Less Zombie, and we will be talking big ideas. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please share, rate, review, or subscribe to one of our channels. A big thank you to Biz Simply for supporting us, bringing great insights, strategies, and tools to help the industry thrive, not just survive. Check them out at bizsimply.com or on their social at bizsimply or bizsimplyhq. You can also email them directly on advice at bizsimply.com. A big thank you to Fina Charlton, who is the show producer and editor from the Podcast Collective. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to the newsletter and download free leadership tools at hospitalitymavericks.com. 
And don't worry, if you didn't get all of this, there will be links in the show notes. I'm Michael Tingser, and you've been listening to the Hospitality Maverick podcast show. Be Maverick.